Some of you are probably here for the first time, and if so, we want to accord you a, a special welcome. And I'm also delighted to welcome our many live stream viewers. We have more live stream facilities than ever before for this evening's program, I believe. It's just wonderful that we're able to share tonight's thought-provoking program with you all. We're pleased and excited that a number of synagogues have partnered with JTS by holding public screenings of tonight's program. And I would like to extend a special welcome to Tiferet Israel Congregation in Washington, DC, Temple Israel, Sharon, Massachusetts, Beth Israel Congregation, Jackson, Mississippi, Temple Beth Shalom, Fairlawn, New Jersey, Congregation Sons of Israel, Malapan, Manalapan, New Jersey, Congregation Beth Shalom, Teaneck, New Jersey, Congregation B'nai Israel, Thomas River, New Jersey, Congregation Agudat Achim, Niskayuna, New York, Niskayuna, thank you, Niskayuna, uh, Midway Jewish Center, Syosset, New York, Congregation Agudas Achim, Austin, Texas. He's partisan because Rabbi Neil Blumhoff, one of tonight's speakers, is its spiritual leader. And to all the other groups who joined us, it's a pleasure for us to have you. It's, of course, our great pleasure and honor to be joined by tonight's presenters, Dr. Jack Wertheimer, Rabbi Dan Smuckler, Rabbi Jessica Minim, and Rabbi Neil Blumhoff. Their topic is Renewing American Judaism, Experimentation, and Creativity in a Changing Landscape. I want to say a few words about the Henry N. and Selma S. Rappaport Lecture. This, this annual lecture was originally endowed in 1982 by Mrs. Selma S. Rappaport, Ali a past president of the Women's League of Conservative Judaism and a longtime member of the JTS board. Um, in, and she endowed the lecture in memory of her husband, Henry N. Rappaport. Henry Rappaport was a distinguished attorney and committed Jew. He served as president of Temple Israel Center in White Plains and later as president of the United Synagogue. He was an active member of the JTS board and a generous benefactor of JTS's scholarly programs. I'm pleased to recognize the presence of this evening of Henry and Selma Rappaport's sons, Michael and his wife, Joanne, and David together with his wife, Deborah, as well as the other family members who are joining us. We thank the Rappaport family for its generous support. And now I'm pleased to introduce tonight's speakers, beginning with our keynote speaker, Dr. Jack Wertheimer. Dr. Wertheimer is the Joseph and Martha Mendelssohn Professor of American Jewish History at JTS. He writes about religious, communal, and educational trends in American Jewish life since World War II. He's the author or editor of more than a dozen volumes, including The American Synagogue, A Sanctuary Transformed, the Uses of Tradition, Jewish Continuity in the Modern Era, Jews in the Center, Conservative Synagogues and Their Members, and A People Divided, Judaism in Contemporary America, which won a National Jewish Book Award for Best Study on Contemporary Jewish Life. His most recent work and the inspiration for tonight's program is The New American Judaism, How Jews Practice Their Religion Today, which won a 2018 National Jewish Book Award in the American Jewish Studies category. At the end of the program, Dr. Wertheimer has agreed to be available to sign copies of his new book, which will be on sale in the room to my right. Following Dr. Wertheimer's presentation, we will hear from three innovative leaders in the following order. Rabbi Dan Smuckler is the inaugural Chief Innovation Officer at Hillel International. Stand next to Jack. He founded Hillel Senior Jewish Educator Initiative in 2008, and in 2011 was named one of the 36 under 36 change makers in Jewish life. Ordained by Rabbi Zalman Nehemia Goldberg of Jerusalem's highest rabbinical court, he earned his PhD in education and Jewish studies at NYU. Rabbi Jessica Menon, who was ordained at JTS, is director of Jewish learning at one table whose mission is to make Shabbat dinner accessible to tens of thousands of people who otherwise would be absent from Jewish community. She is a sought-after educator who has led workshops for Hillel, Pardes, Jewish Federations of North America, Limud, Moshe House, and Birthright Israel, as well as numerous other communal organizations and synagogues. 
Finally, Rabbi Neil Blumhoff is a is senior rabbi of Congregation Agudas Achim in Austin, Texas, which creates Jewish experiences in diverse, unexpected places. He has a weekly podcast about jazz called Liner Notes on NPR and produces music events in Austin where he speaks and performs, creating connections between Jewish wisdom and improvisational jazz. He was ordained as a rabbi at JTS, where he also earned the diploma of Chazan. Our program will proceed as follows. After the presentations, our speakers will engage in a conversation to expand on a number of key points, and then we will invite questions from the audience. I will then offer some concluding remarks. And so as you see, what we have is Jack Wertheimer, one of the world's leading experts on American Jewish history, who has just come out with an award-winning book on the American Jewish scene, which highlights not only what has been continuously going on for some time, but what is new on the American Jewish scene today. And Jack is going to be followed by our three panelists, who are themselves active in producing much of what is new on the American Jewish scene today. And so this program, kaleidoscopically, should leave us all with a good sense of what we can do, what we should do, what we are doing, and perhaps what we are not doing um, to our detriment. It's now my great privilege to call on my friend, Dr. Jack Wertheimer, to begin what I know will be a most illuminating evening. Jack, thanks. Thank you, Chancellor Eisen, for that uh, very generous introduction. And my thanks also to the Rappaport family. This is not the first time that I've done a Rappaport lecture. Several decades ago, I did one as well. And it, it led, in fact, to a book that Chancellor Eisen referred to, The Uses of Tradition. It's also a, a privilege for me to share the platform with three uh, young, younger than me at least, uh, innovative leaders. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here with them and also with you. Um, so the title of this evening's session has to do with the renewal of Jewish life. And the most basic question to be asked is, well, why does it have to be renewed? Uh, and the answer is that uh, Jewish life, specifically religious life, that's my focus, uh, is challenged. And I want to begin by speaking about a number of the challenges that face us today. I think one would have to be living in a cave not to realize that religion today in America is not uh, held in the same high esteem uh, as it has been in the past. Uh, there are serious challenges facing it. I'm going to outline just a couple uh, of those challenges. Uh, so uh, to begin with, realize we're living in a time uh, in which people speak about the new atheism, um, the very public uh, pronouncements that are made by academics, leading academics and intellectuals uh, that attack religion. And we've been living through an era uh, like that. Uh, we're also living in an era in which, frankly, religion uh, has uh, brought upon itself a great deal of scorn, at least some religious leaders have. Uh, leaders of a number of different religions who've been involved in terrible, horrific um, abuse cases, for example, uh, and who have covered up those abuse cases. And that has, uh, that has affected the, uh, the public uh, view of religion uh, in general. Uh, and then there's the whole question of the larger culture and the extent to which the larger culture is supportive of religion or not so. And the example that I would cite for you is to take you back uh, a number of decades to the post-World War II period when um, as new settlements were established, new communities, new developments uh, in the suburbs, one of the selling points of those uh, new developments was houses of worship. Uh, the presence of houses of worship was, was seen as a very positive thing. We don't see the same kind of attention paid to religion today as a positive uh, within American life. There are exceptions to this, of course, in certain parts of this country especially, uh, but those uh, exceptions generally are not part of the culture with which most American Jews actually identify and interact with uh, the most. Uh, and beyond the, these external factors, there are also internal factors. 
Um, we are all aware of the very dramatic rise uh, in the incidence of intermarriage uh, in the Jewish community. And while we know very well uh, that there are offspring of intermarried family, families who are very much involved in Jewish life, some of our students here at JTS and at other rabbinical schools and Jewish institutions are children uh, of intermarried parents. For the most part, um, the offspring of intermarried families are not involved with religious life. They may identify in some way as partially Jewish, but religion is not something that, that they are particularly uh, interested in. Uh, and then there's the question of uh, the culture of younger people uh, and uh, this, the, the famous or infamous millennials uh, whom lots of people are trying to understand and pigeonhole and place into boxes. Um, the question is to what extent uh, millennials are interested in religion per se, and I trust we'll hear a lot more about that a little bit later on this evening. Uh, but there too, uh, the so-called woke community, don't ask me to define it, I don't have a clue, um, the, uh, is not particularly interested uh, in religion. Uh, someone recently said at a session, part of our challenge is to make religion also part of being woke. Um, and so we have a variety of circumstances that uh, today are creating an environment in which religion is just not held in great esteem uh, and is not uh, something that a great many American Jews are prepared to invest a lot of themselves in. Uh, and then the further complication is the skills level, if you will, of lots of American Jews, uh, where it's more difficult for lots of Jews to participate in synagogue life, for example, um, reading the Hebrew of the prayers, understanding the prayers, relating to the prayers. And so we have a variety of circumstances that have emerged. My focus uh, this, for the rest of my remarks is going to be on responses to these challenges. Uh, because just to lay out the difficulties that we're facing uh, is telling only a very uh, an important but a limited uh, amount of this story. And uh, in writing uh, my book, The New American Judaism, uh, of course, one possible question you could ask me, by the way, is, so what's new? And that's precisely what I want to speak about. What are some of the developments on the positive side of this, of this story uh, that would uh, illustrate the newness of what is happening? Uh, and in the book, I, I devote a particular attention to three nodes or three types of, uh, of areas where uh, we can see evidence of renewal at work. The first type may surprise you because it has come under so much attack and criticism, and that is the synagogue. Synagogues across the spectrum have, many of them, have engaged in efforts to rethink, especially tefillah, the prayer service, and how it is conducted. And having interviewed, as I did for this book, over 160 rabbis of different types, what was so striking to me was the investment that they made in rethinking prayer in order to create an environment that would be stimulating to their congregants and also enticing to their congregants. What have they been doing? Some of these things are well, uh, you're, you're well familiar with. Uh, they have been, first of all, rethinking the role of music and the type of music that um, that uh, the liturgy uh, is accompanied by. Uh, and again, we see this across the spectrum. Orthodox synagogues and conservative synagogues and reform synagogues all have been rethinking the uses of music, in some cases by also introducing instrumentation or new kinds of instrumentation along with the prayers, in other cases not using instrumentation but instead uh, using new types of compositions of, um, of liturgical music. And also the choreography of uh, synagogue services have been rethought in the sense of everything from the 
the, the, the physical arrangement of synagogues. Lots of synagogues now uh, are, have essentially reverted to a previous practice uh, of placing the shulchan uh, where the Torah is read in the center of the congregation rather in the front. The whole notion of rabbis and cantors serving as high priests on a high stage far removed from the congregation has been rethought. Uh, even the fixity of the seats uh, has been rethought. Uh, in my own synagogue, we are in the process right now, we've ripped out all of the fixed pews and instead there, there are uh, movable chairs that uh, will be introduced. Why? For the purpose of uh, being flexible and creating a situation where instead of si sitting auditorium style and looking at the back of the head of the person sitting in front of you, uh, you will ins instead be able to face people and interact uh, with them so that the whole service will be much more interactive. One other thing I will mention that's particularly striking to me in conservative synagogues, it didn't begin uh, last week or even a decade ago, it's been going on for a while, uh, but it continues apace, and that is the extent to which conservative synagogues have been educating their members who are interested in learning how to read Torah and reminding people about the Haftorah that they may have read at the time of their bar or bat mitzvah so that uh, they can learn how to recite the Haftorah uh, as adults as well. Both of these are examples of encouraging uh, congregants to part be participants, active participants in the service, again, rather than a passive audience. So these are some of the examples of what uh, congregations are, are doing in the, specifically in the uh, sanctuary sphere of the synagogue. There are other things that they do in terms of building community, uh, but I want to focus on the specifically uh, prayer dimension of synagogues. The second uh, area of explosive growth in reaction to the circumstances of American Jewish life uh, is in the sector that I would call, I do call, uh, the Orthodox outreach sector. Uh, there is a vast population of Orthodox Jews who are engaged full-time and others part-time in reaching out to other Jews and encouraging them to take on a mitzvah or more than one mitzvah uh, and participate in Jewish religious life a bit more than they have done so in the past. This is a massive enterprise. We don't have precise numbers, but my estimate is that there are more Orthodox outreach workers, men and women, uh, involved in this enterprise than there are non-Orthodox rabbis in America combined. Shall I say that again? There is a vast population that of, of Orthodox outreach workers that, that outnumbers all non-Orthodox rabbis combined. Um, and the nature of that enterprise is something that we need to pay attention to. Uh, there are some synagogues that have been trying to learn from uh, some of the activities of Orthodox outreach workers. Uh, clearly, to an extent, this uh, enterprise is competitive with what synagogues are doing, and yet in other ways it's also complementary to what synagogues are doing, because there are members of, of, of conservative synagogues, of reform synagogues, reconstructionist ones, who attend the, the study programs, let's say, uh, at, a, at a, a community kolel, or at Chabad, or Eish Torah, and then they go back to their conservative reform, reconstructionist synagogues as full participants. I'm friendly with a Chabad rabbi uh, who one day, when I spoke to him, said, Jack, you'll never guess who was seated, seated around my table this past Sunday morning when we were studying Torah. It was the president of the conservative synagogue and the president of the reform temple. Seated at the table, we all studied together. They went back to their congregations. So there is a competitive element, and I'm not denying that, but there's also a complementary uh, element to this orthodox outreach. Uh, and the third area, uh, which comes now closest to what we're gonna hear a lot more about in the, over the course of the next hour, uh, that area has to do with um, 
the burgeoning of efforts sometimes spearheaded by, by individual Jews, particularly younger Jews, and in some cases spearheaded by large foundations to develop programs to help engage uh, Jews, and again, especially younger Jews, in Jewish life with some religious dimensions uh, to them. Uh, this is a huge enterprise that's exploding on the American Jewish scene. Um, they're uh, go just going online. I'm constantly struck by all the new examples uh, that, that, that uh, uh, pop up. Um, and uh, these efforts are designed, again, to provide environments, settings for some kind of religious congregating often outside of synagogues, although in some cases, synagogues help to sponsor those activities. Um, sometimes they are not, uh, mo in most cases, they're not necessarily involved in offering religious services, but they will offer, as we will hear, a Friday night dinner with Kiddush and Hamotzi as examples of ways in which younger Jews can participate in some aspects of religious ritual. And we'll hear more about that uh, as well. So these are, are, are examples of the explosion of, of uh, vitality and responses to the kinds of challenges that I have noted for you. Uh, in thinking about um, these types of responses, there are um, a couple of implications for this institution and other training institutions also uh, as they think about what the rabbis and the cantors and the educators, Jewish educators of the future, will need. Uh, one thing which has become very clear is the need to become entrepreneurial. Um, it, it is no longer the case that uh, rabbis uh, who are ordained at our major seminaries will necessarily be able to parachute into an existing synagogue um, and become an assistant rabbi and then work their way up to an associate and a, then the senior rabbi, and that will necessarily be their entire career. Uh, but rather, there are rabbis who will have to found their own congregations, and they will have to seek out congregants. This time of the year is a perfect time to do it. There are uh, rabbis who will place themselves in the aisles of supermarkets here leading in the lead up to Pesach, uh, and will stand in the aisles where the Passover goods are, and it's a wonderful opportunity for them to shake hands, meet people, and introduce themselves, and in the process perhaps um, win over some people who will give their congregations uh, a try. Uh, this is part of the entrepreneur entrepreneurial nature of what the rabbinate uh, will need to be uh, involved with. Uh, second of all, uh, what I would cite here is uh, a book that uh, made quite an impact and has been read widely, written by a colleague at the American Jewish University uh, named Ron Wolfson, a book entitled Relational Judaism. And the emphasis of that book is that in order to attract people into synagogue life, it's critical that people feel that um, they are seen that they are recognized, that they're not treated as strangers, but rather that they are welcomed and that someone is paying attention to them. Uh, and Wolfson's argument is, is that rabbis need to play that kind of role and synagogues need to play that kind of role. A kind of openness and recognition that when people come in, especially those who, look, who are unfamiliar, that they are uh, in, in invited in and introduced to others. Last in this category, what I would make reference to is a particular concern of mine, which I'll want to raise a bit more with my colleagues this evening, and that is um, the possibility of shifting from what I refer to as engagement opportunities uh, to uh, helping people become much more actively involved on a regular basis. Translating that into English, what I mean is that there are lots of ways now in which, and programs, to draw individuals to specific uh, initiatives, to specific programs. Um, these often tend to be episodic engagements, and the question is how can we move from the episodic to encourage more uh, people to look upon Jewish religious life as something that requires frequency, as opposed to a one-off type of experience. 
My final remark uh, uh, comes to the question of creativity and, uh, and the need for innovation. Uh, I'm sure you have heard of a book that appeared maybe six, seven years ago um, titled Startup Nation, um, which was a study about the technological prowess uh, of Israelis. Uh, and of course, what it emphasized was the extent to which Israelis, uh, especially in the tech sector, developed all kinds of new techniques um, that, were, that are necessary uh, in contemporary uh, life, and particularly necessary for the state of Israel, including military technology to defend the state of, of Israel. Um, they address the challenge, in other words, of Israeli security. We have a different set of challenges, uh, which also have to do with our security, not so much our physical security, but if you will, our collective security, our, sp our spiritual security as Jewish people in this country. Uh, that's the great challenge we face today, and it's my hope that um, we will rise to that challenge and not only demonstrate that American Jews are equally creative when it comes to technology, when it comes to investment banking, when it comes to all these enterprises and the arts that Jews are involved in, all very important, but that we also will find the, the creativity uh, to address the internal challenges that we face to Jewish life. And I think we'll hear a lot more about that now from our speakers. Thank you. Hi, good evening. It's, it's really a privilege uh, to be here uh, with colleagues, and thank you to the Rappaport family and to JTS for having us here this evening. I said it's really a privilege to be here, and thank you to the Rappaport family and to, uh, and to JTS and to Jack for having us here this evening. If you were to look across uh, the American Jewish scene, particularly at younger people, I'll define those as people under 40. I'm 40 years old. I have three children, so I feel a little bit old. Uh, imagining that, but younger people, folks under 40, you would see a pretty clear master trend uh, that most of us are familiar with. There is a retreat from large institutions, particularly membership dues-based institutions. There's a retreat from ideology and denominations. There's an interest in the self as a curated, presentable experience. And uh, there is also a, a sort of retreat from communal norms, particularly in marriage and vociferous Zionism. That's the basket of trends that you can commonly see among young people. Retreat from institutions, retreat from ideology, the self as something that you curate and present, uh, and then a retreat from communal norms. If you look with a more fine-grained lens, you'll see a different set of trends. There's a huge movement towards ritual that's not clear uh, at the surface. I actually interviewed someone today, I kid you not, who insisted that he was building a kosher venison farm in upstate New York and was learning shechita. This was a non-Orthodox rabbi who was deeply passionate about learning the art of kosher slaughter and was not the first person I've met who's interested in such. Profound interest in ritual. There is a movement to the home, away from the synagogue and institution. The idea that what happens in a home has a unique and elevated and sanctified value is new and unique among people uh, who are under 40 in contrast to the world that I grew up in, where membership in the institution or the synagogue or the sanctuary was more prevalent. There's a willingness to passionately oppose major communal causes, whether that's in marriage or uh, a vociferous Zionism. Whether or not I agree with those positions, I put to the side, but the willingness to passionately oppose something indicates a profound interest in it. The opposite of interest is not opposition, the opposite of interest is indifference. And third, there's a, or fourth rather, there's a huge interest in Torah study. Uh, there's a huge interest in Torah study. I'd like to show you just two concrete expressions of those trends. First, um, in Hillel, where I work, uh, we run the largest Jewish educational program on campus. It's called the Jewish Learning Fellowship, JLF. 10 weeks of Torah study, two and a half hours at a time, people learning sugiot and gemara, sections of halakha, psukim, midrashim, and a sort of open conversational style. 
Uh, that program started at NYU six years ago and is now on 159 campuses serving 3,800 people. I have a waiting list, a waiting list of 700 people who would like to be studying Torah in that program right now. That's at Harvard and Penn and Princeton and University of Michigan and UCLA and at FAU in Florida and at George Washington University and at the Virginia Military Institute and College of the Canyons and at any place you've ever heard of where there are Jews, there's JLF. That's thousands of people learning Torah every single week. If you had told me that when I was in college in the year 2000, I would have laughed at you. That was simply not a trend. Secondly, uh, BASE is a program that we run in Hillel. BASE is the home of a rabbinic couple, rabbi and spouse, and they open their home as a BASE kivyachol for serving young adults, 20s and 30s. They host every Friday night, but they also host every Saturday day, and they do Havdalah, and they read the Megillah in their home, and they host Pesach Seders, and they study with people in groups, and they study with people one-on-one, -on -one, but critically, they're not a program, they're rabbis meaning when someone's parent or grandparent dies, chas v'shalom, when someone gets sick, when someone breaks up, when someone needs pastoral care, they don't go back to the synagogue they were raised in. They go to the person whose house they've been going to every Friday night that year. There's a base 25 blocks north of here. There's a base 40 blocks south of here. There's one in Brooklyn. There's two in Miami. There's one in Los Angeles. There's one in Ithaca. There's one in Berlin. There's three in Chicago. Uh, base is serving about 15,000 people six times or more a year. The rabbis are conservative, reform, and orthodox, gay and straight, but the rabbis are deeply traditional. If you were to tell me that people would graduate college and would go and want to be at Shabbat dinners and at Sudot Purim and reading the Megillah and going to Pesach Seders and singing songs and studying Torah in a deep, rich environment that models a Jewish home for people, I also would have laughed at you. Uh, so there are really bright spots that are happening among young people, but it looks different than what we ever thought before. I'd just like to conclude with two other remarks, if I may, I'm being mindful of the time of my colleagues who are, are over here as well. Um, the first is whatever the innovations are that are lighting up the hearts and minds of young people, they must answer uh, profoundly human existential concerns, not just parochial uh, communal concerns. Not that one is better or worse than the other, but that's the way the culture is oriented today. I don't know if you saw in New York Magazine, there was a wonderful article by Andrew Sullivan about trends of drug use. Did anyone see this article? It was extraordinary. And in it, he pointed out that the drug that's being used in a generation mirrors the needs of the cultural moment. So in, in the 1960s, people are using psychedelica. In the 70s, there's downers and lewds. In the 80s, people are taking cocaine and driving hard. What does it mean when an entire generation of people are using opioids and anesthetics? No one goes partying on fentanyl. Um, it's a desire to be numb, to be alone. There's a profound sense of human isolation and desperation and loneliness and disconnection. Can Jewish communal life meet that most profound existential human need on a person-by-person -person retail basis? That's the first thing. The second point that I would make is something I actually heard on the radio not so long ago in an interview with Alec Baldwin, the actor. They asked him, when was the time when you were uh, most scared to perform? full of stage fright. Baldwin said, streetcar named desire. And the interviewer said, that's, that's shocking. Why would that scare you? And he says, because I'm in a lot of movies and TV, but streetcar named desire, that material's good. So if the show is terrible, it means that I put it on badly. The material works. For all the innovation that's out there, when you boil it down to its core, what we're really talking about are Shabbat dinners, the study of Torah, the practice of mitzvot. The material works. It survived thousands of years, and it came to America. If it can't work in the freest, most powerful open society that we've ever had, it's kind of on us. We have to find better ways to present it. The material works. And you're going to hear from that, my colleagues here, who are among the best of the best presenting that kind of material. Thank you. OK, my friends, what would happen just wait for this. What would happen if we all ended our week with intention, with good food, good wine, and good friends? What would happen? We might be happy. We might create a sense of connection. It's just good for you. And it's not out of reach. In Judaism, we have a practice for that. It's called Shabbat. It's built in. We invented the weekend. 
What a good idea. I want to show up for that. And I think a lot of my peers do too. There's three of them right there who showed up for that. Right? The idea at my organization, One Table, is that ending your week with intention can change your life. It can change your life. It's just good for you. I want to tell you a little bit about what we do and how I think it's a part of the story that Jack so eloquently tells. And I need the book. You all are going to buy this right out there, right? See what I did there? Yeah. <laughs> this photo on the front is from Burning Man. And judging by this crowd, you've all been to Burning Man. <laughs> For real, sister, you hit me up right after. All right, this is the milk and honey camp at Burning Man, and they were partially supported by One Table to create the intention of ending your week at Burning Man with Shabbat. Okay, and hundreds of people showed up. Thank you. So that's how One Table was born, with this idea of we're sitting on a good idea. We're sitting on something hot, like Dan said. So how do we share it? We started by design thinking, not by saying this is what you should know, but by saying where are you already going? What are you already doing? And it's not just Burning Man, it's, it's dinner and happy hour and going out and trying to meet people and making connections. Right? That's what people were already doing on Friday night. Now, I focus on millennials. I happen to also be a millennial, but my work focuses on the millennial population. And after about eight months of user-centered design, of working and talking with other millennials and asking, who are you in the world? And what, if anything, does your Judaism have to say about it? We found out that the scariest thing about Judaism, the scariest thing about taking ownership of it and doing it in your home wasn't the prayers and the blessings and the words and the choreography and the ritual. The scariest thing was having people over. And if I sound emotional, it's because I am, it's sad. The scariest thing was the hospitality, having people over and welcoming, welcoming them into your own home. Because how much do you cook for 10 people? And, and what do you do about conversation? What are you gonna talk about? And are people gonna wanna be there? Or what if you go to a dinner party and you're trapped, you've all been at this dinner party, you're trapped next to somebody and you can't move and you're talking to that dude all night, okay? So nobody wants to be in that position, so how do you handle all that stuff? And the answers to those questions are deeply Jewish because we share and have the ability to impart the value of Hachnas Arachim. So when we're talking about the Shabbat dinner table, we're, we're suddenly talking about how you create community in your own home. You start by asking, where are you already in your life? And how can Shabbat dinner and the experience of Shabbat become a part of that? Well, it turns out that Shabbat is a universal value that people already love. Because who doesn't love the weekend? And when you ask millennials about their religious practice, you know what they say? 80% of them, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I'm spiritual. They are religious. <laughs> They're defining it in different ways. We're owning it in different ways. We're expressing it in different ways. So my job is to reach out. And to, I've never stood in the aisle on Pesach, but now I'm like, maybe I should. <laughs> Get some new one tablers. <laughs> but the idea is really, you know, Shabbat happens every week, so why don't you take a chance? You're not ready to host a dinner? Why don't you go to one? Um, let me give you the tools to do that. Let me help you frame what it might look like to embrace blessing. Let me help you understand that raising the Kiddush cup is about sanctifying time. And isn't wine an incredible conduit to do that? Wow, good idea, Judaism. Right? And then we get into a space where people are starting to have their friends over, and their friends come over, and this is where the shift happens from the, from the Kiruv model that Professor Wertheimer was talking about of Orthodox outreach. Here's a shift. Rather than being aspirational, 
right? Don't come to my house to do Shabbat, right? Because what's going to happen if you come to my house to do Shabbat? I'm the rabbi. I'm going to do it. It's going to be awesome. (laughs) But it doesn't necessarily inspire you. I don't want you to aspire to be like me. I want to inspire you to be like you. What do you love? Guess what? There's a Shabbat dinner for that. You can do that. You can have an alumni dinner. You can feature different foods. You can try different things out because Shabbat happens every week. And enduring practice matters. This is not a one-off. It's not a holiday. It's not a one-time retreat. It's a weekly opportunity to gather with intention with friends who you already know and friends who you haven't met yet. How does that happen? Well, we give you support. There's some financial support. We give you nourishment because we want you to have access to food and drink to elevate the experience. No, we don't need to see your receipts. We're all adults here. Elevate your table. Get beautiful things to put out on your table. Get delicious food. And if you order pizza, you better take it out of the box because it's Shabbat, right? If you love pizza, do it, but take it out of the box. Elevate the experience. That's what One Table is about. And we help you connect with other people who want to share that and may not even know it yet. Say you move to a new city. Millennials are entirely mobile. We're all over the place. We're moving around. We want to connect. We want to meet people. You go to onetable.org. You find a dinner in your city. You download the app. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. There I go. I found myself a seat at the table. Whoosh, 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 there I go. I'm hosting my own Shabbat dinner. I have nourishment credit from one table. I have support. I have resources. I have someone who sat down with me and had a cup of coffee and said, you know what, you can do this. And you don't need to go to a class and you don't need to sit in a lecture because this is in you. Here are the resources. Go do it this Friday night. And don't come to my house to do it. I'm going to come to your house. Actually, I don't go to the dinners. (laughs) That would be a lot. Here's what I want to close with. When you give people the tools to create their own Judaism and claim ownership over this amazing tradition, it changes the game. Suddenly, they become the producers. They're not participants. They're producers. They're the producers of their own Jewish experiences. And it's life-changing. I know it's changed mine. I'm looking at three people whose lives it changed. I think it's important to remember that even the smallest, most simple, straightforward, good ideas in Judaism, something as inherent to being Jewish Jewish as Shabbat, can reach, as we have in the past four and a half years, over 115,000 young people in over 180 cities across the country. My friends, this is just the beginning. So I know it's a Thursday, but Shabbat Shalom. Good evening, everybody. Hello? Good, nice to see you all. It's great to see you, and uh, I just wanted to express my gratitude for JTS and the Rappaport family for hosting this beautiful lecture. And it's really wonderful to see uh, both uh, Chancellor Ismar Shorsh and Chancellor Arnie Eisen. Thank you so much. And it's uh, great to be here with uh, my esteemed learned folks and friends and uh, Dr. Wertheimer as well. And I want to give a shout out to my community in Austin for uh, realizing that this is important. And just before Rosh Chodesh Nisan, here I am in New York City traveling back to Austin on Friday. I also want to mention uh, and give gratitude, uh, representing as I do the the synagogues, (laughs) uh, all of those who denote their lives uh, for caring for, inspiring, and uplifting communities. It is a uh, arduous and difficult sometimes work uh, as we contend not only with the exigencies of the everyday, but also dispelling shop-worn narratives and the heavy baggage and expectation that many come as they seek out and explore synagogues. And basically, I would like to just continue the conversations that really the three of you have begun, and I'd like to bring them into the synagogue of expanding the modalities of a synagogue and of what is possible in a synagogue. 
And Jack, it's great that you guys are ripping up the chairs and seeing what's what. That's the, the, that's the beginning of the beginning. And going out into the kosher sections of, of the stores, and stuff, that's great, but that is, that's um, already should be in the foundation. And what happens after that is the larger uh, translation of Judaism as a wisdom tradition, not only to the Jewish community, but out into the world or. I see uh, also, I, I don't see it as an either or proposition. I see it as a both and. And uh, I think that wherever we stand in the synagogue, those not yet in the synagogue, those who are just allies in the community, uh, that we can cultivate all of us, the generosity and the collaboration of like-minded people. And I think all of that fits into what the missions of a synagogue can be. And uh, just a word about innovation, because I think that's really important, and just a couple of things. And would you all do an experiment with me a little bit later? Would that be all right? I'm only going to talk for 10 minutes, so it's already halfway done. So <laughs> we're, we're okay? All right. Three of you said yes. Okay, five of you said yes. Thank you. So I want to talk about innovation, but innovation is not done for innovation's sake. It's done in the stratum of a synagogue. And I do believe, and maybe we'll have this conversation, that there's actually a shelf life for innovation. I used to be of millennial age. <laughs> I used to be 40. And I just want to speak about how uh, if we do what we do contingent on marketplace and demographics, I think we're missing a bigger piece of things. And, and Dan and Jess, you both hit it. You both said, most critical is significance and meaning. And for me, that means building innovation on the strong, established, traditional practices of a synagogue like Daily Minion, like Mitzvot, like Torah study, like Hevra Kedisha. And encouraging an extension, sorry, I should be in here, sorry. Exter ex encouraging an extension of what is already established. And tradition and grounding are important. And it is important for us too, just I'm going to say this too, to not sacrifice our denotive power on the false ramparts of political partisanship to be still versed and always versed in the simple everyday needs, anxieties, and expectations of community members. And for each of us as religious leaders who are always routinely sort of seen as some of the loneliest people doing our work, nevertheless, to always strive for impeccable example and intentional communication and in constantly looking to raise the bar for all of us. So we're here, there's been a lot of words spoken, we're still here, you guys had a long day? Okay, some of you commuted from Texas? No, nobody from Texas. Some of you commuted, but just almost as long, right? But I, I think it's also uh, incumbent upon those who are leading these sacred, fragile crafts, and again, speaking for synagogues specifically, is to cultivate others to appreciate the unexpected. To always do what we do that's not only life-affirming, but also life-changing. And I'm glad you mentioned Ron's book, but I'd like us again to think about beyond relational Judaism and to think about all of us softening our hearts to thrive. For many times, whether established members of my own community or people who Googled synagogues and saw mine or people who've just moved to town, essentially, adopt a posture of saying, all right, Rabbi, tell me about your synagogue. And that's undoing a lot of work. So rather than speak about specific studies or the innovative things that we're doing or the traditional things that we're doing, just ask him just to take a breath. And I'm going to ask you all to do the same thing. Are you breathing? Hello? You can close your eyes for a second. Maybe some of you already have your eyes closed. <laughs> take a deep breath if you don't mind. One more time. And I think there's a value, even if it's a lecture or a class, of promoting, and, the, and there's a benefits of a mixed presentation, which I'd like to do now. So you've heard a lot of things. Another deep breath. Ya la la, ye la, la, ye la. Yai, lai, 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 lai. Can you all try that, please? 
Yala la 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 ya la 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 second part Yala la 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 ya la 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 try it Yala la 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 ya la 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 Ya la 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 you did this part already Ya la 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 ya la 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 Ya la 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 ya la 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 Ya la 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 ya la 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 Ya la 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 ya la 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 last part ya la 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 ya la la ya la 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 ya la la one more time the whole thing ya la 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 ya la 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 ya la 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 ya la 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 ya la 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 ya la 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 ya la la ya la 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 ya la la so maybe the energy shifted a little you're clenching and doing and maybe you're open to kind of get out of your own way to dispel those narratives to allow us to do that important work one person at a time to maybe think about putting a cap and I'm coming from the southwest not the northeast putting a cap on the memberships of our synagogues and recognizing that we can plant and blossom and not to get out of hand and to realize we're all doing it for a ineffable purpose for God and for us to recognize that as has been mentioned and as we'll discuss all of this is so important and beyond whatever earthly reasons we're doing what we do and as i think about what i do as i serve you know 70 plus hours a week i think it's important that i view my work as a mandala as a tremendous effort to create it only to let it go and to prioritize our efforts and to realize that as i inspire others that is contagious and galvanizing other people as well so if you've learned anything from what i have to say there's a lot of different ways to do things and i think synag and rabbis in synagogues are play a variety of roles maybe utility infielders and we recognize too that we have to inspire in places like JTS engaged fearless and healthy leaders together with supportive populations who are both valued and encouraged engaging both cutting edge theories and exploring best practices with the nuts and bolts of a synagogue which is asking people to realize why their lives matter and that they do matter so we get to work in a beautiful greenhouse for this job of metamorphosis renovation and sometimes revolution so i ask us to think about what we're trying to grow and what is just dross and get to work with that which blooms thank you all very much good that you have the microphone Uh, uh, Neil, you made the comment before about uh, innovation and asking us to uh, place some constraints on our excitement about innovation. But I must tell you that, in my estimation, this is the first Rappaport lecture in which a nigun was sung. Am I correct about that? Um, I, I hope it's not the last. 
good enough. So I, I'd like to, uh, to ask uh, each of you to comment on what's frankly a preoccupation of mine, um, and it came up in, in all of your presentations in different ways. Um, what's my preoccupation? The extent to which, particularly outside of the Orthodox community, religious life has increasingly been relegated to the synagogue, and uh, the home has been largely stripped of religious life. And so I'm interested in hearing uh, from Jess and from Dan about the extent to which um, you see any uh, transition, any transfer from the developments you've described, which are outside the synagogue, that might lead into the synagogue, and conversely, Neil, I'd be interested in hearing about the reverse. You know, to what extent are, are you working with your congregants to infuse their homes with religious life? Mm -hmm. so shall we just go in the order in which you spoke this time around? Then we'll yeah. So I think one of the unique things about One Table is that it happens in the home. And despite the name of our organization, you don't need a table. Uh, one of the other things that comes up a lot in our initial conversations with young adults is they can't, <laughs> they can't engage in this incredible Jewish experience because they don't have a table. And I'm like, honey, I'll buy you a table, <laughs> okay? But really what I wanna say is that you don't need the table. What you need is a place. You need a, a gathering place. So for the majority of our hosts and guests, what we're asking them to do is think about the ways in which their own home can become the center of Jewish practice, can become a center of Jewish learning, and beco can become a platform for them to share that with others. The way that works is that they invite people they know, but they also invite people they don't know. They can save seats, communal seats, using our platform or our app. Why that matters is because it allows them to really understand that their home functions as a Jewish gathering place. Their table can really function the way that it was always meant to, as, as an altar, as a place to have an encounter with a power greater than ourselves. And they may choose to call that power God, but that may be after their fifth or sixth dinner. <laughs> but we also like to say that Shabbat dinner is a rising tide that lifts all boats. And I think you can see that from our communal partners. Show me the Jewish organization or the synagogue or the initiative that doesn't want to engage people in Shabbat. You can't. Everyone wants to engage in Shabbat and use it as a tool. It's an incredible tool in the Jewish toolbox. We should definitely use it. So we have these incredible partners, among them base. I've led Shabbat dinners at Base Hillel. Those rabbis have helped support our hosts and guests. We're not just friends, we're colleagues. Our organizations support each other. And so sitting at a one-table dinner, you might find out about Honeymoon Israel, an opportunity for you and your non-Jewish partner to go to Israel, and your life will change. Sitting at the Shabbat dinner table, you might find out, because we've had a bunch of dinners in Austin, you might find out about this amazing Rabbi Chazan jazz guy who has a podcast, a radio show on NPR. And that's how the rising tide works. It may start in your home, but by becoming the producer of your own Jewish experience, you actually end up encountering other Jews and other avenues to engage in Jewish life. So I, I, I'd say I, I share um, Jess's analysis by half, um, which is that I, I think there's an extraordinary educational power uh, to the home, and it, it stands in dialectical relationship to synagogues. Um, you know, the, there's no substitute for what can be accomplished within a home in terms of um, educating people, both Latovu Lara, and ideally the synagogue is, as, as Fishbane calls it, uh, the home of homes, is a collection of many homes that is both constructed of those homes and then acts back upon them as a kind of uh, bulwark against some of our greatest excesses. Uh, what's, what's weird about the time that we're living in is that not only are people living longer, but the space between when you leave the home you grew up in and when you form a new home uh, is extraordinarily long. So I operate in what we call now the home-to-home -home space uh, that didn't exist when my brother was growing up. Um, so the idea that a person leaves home at 18 years old and goes to some sort of a four-year university and then wanders from 
job to graduate school to relationship to job to graduate school and back and then you know wakes up in their mid 30s partnered ideally maybe maybe not having a child um, that's a good 15 years um, where there isn't the the experience of a home so um, rather than and this is the part where I, I would say I disagree um, rather than invite people to do it theirself I think do it yourself is probably a very small niche part of the market I want to present powerful educational models of what a compelling Jewish home looks like uh, on the assumption that most people haven't seen it, wouldn't know it if they saw it, um, and need to have some kind of a, a compelling um, example of it. I would just also point out that, that for our community, we're the only Jewish community in the world that thinks it's a good idea to take young people at the age of 18 and pluck them from the community that they grew up in with their parents and their aunts and uncles and grandparents and synagogue and summer camp and day school, whatever it might be, and send them to go live in a dorm room monoculture somewhere for four years and then expect there to be a Jewish renaissance. Um, that's an absurd value proposition. We're the only Eda that does that worldwide, and we are reaping the results of it. So we should make a countervailing investment culturally, monetarily, and in terms of our spirit um, in actually filling up that, that new home-to-home -home space that we're seeing. Well, thanks for the wisdom, both of you. And I would just capitalize a little bit on Dan's point as well, is that people need uh, a living example of, of what to do and how to do it. When uh, families or people who would like to concentrate on home rituals get to the synagogue, there's been a, a tremendous amount of cultivation to bring them to the synagogue to get them there, and then for them to realize that they're not alone and to recognize what can be done. And we have sort of um, we both in terms of families, of how to sort of raise a Jewish family, of course many synagogues do, also to um, how to just do certain things, and I think again, it's incumbent upon the leaders who both train those who train those who are looking to also adopt home rituals. Uh, it's very important. My kids uh, certainly know that anytime my phone has rung, that that takes me away from my home, whether it's a funeral or whether it's something else. And that has just been a part of our life. I think it's also very important for the congregation to know that there are certain things that I do that are part of my home and by extension, that will again galvanize others to do the same. In my particular case, Passover is kind of a big deal. We do do a community Seder, it's fantastic and lovely. And one of those nights is devoted to, I've been very public over the years, the 20 years that I've been in Austin, uh, but I'm just over 40, uh, thinking about uh, the ways that Passover means much to my community, um, excuse me, means much to my family, and that translates within community. So it's having specific programs, it's having specific uh, leaders, team leaders, if you will, in the synagogue, and again, it's important for those leading to privilege the home also. Good, thank you. So I also want to pick up on another term, uh, or a number of terms that have come up so far. Um, Dan, you um, started out by itemizing a number of the characteristics that we see today, and one of them had to do with the self. Um, and certainly I, the, I have emphasized in my book the whole the whole question, thank you, of um, do it yourself. You just mentioned it. Do it yourself, Judaism. The uh, the individual, the individualization of of Jewish uh, expression. Um, that's on the one hand, and yet on the other hand, I'm often struck by um, um, the herd of independent minds that we see. In other words, the, that 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 despite all the talk about the self and the 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 interest in, in do-it-yourself uh, Jewish expression, that much of this, in fact, is influenced by social networks and by peers. And I'm wondering whether the three of you might, might comment on what it is that you've observed uh, regarding this tension, if you will, between the two, or between these two categories. Do you want to, do you want to start this time, Neil? Sure, I'm happy to. Okay. You know, I think that there's, again, a healthy balance between do-it-yourself and this uh, sense of, of community structure, the, the tested ways that things are done. And, uh, and I think that if people come to the synagogue, certainly to be familiarized and to sort of, uh, and I think your compelling example about opioids is very important. If, if the synagogue experience is just another sort of benumbing experience to be in a sanctuary, I think that that is, um, that then we failed. I think to wake our community up, both by performative practices of prayer and worship, by engaging but not polarizing divor uh, divrei Torah, and also of ways of realizing that the dance of, uh, of do-it-yourself DIY stuff and standardized stuff is really important. 
Uh, and again, a synagogue, to me, can do all of those things. I think it's, and it acts like the original wellness center, because I think all of that can happen in the exploratory process, knowing that the synagogue is going to be there, and the people with whom you've had relationships are going to be there in the most vulnerable moments. So actually, I think it's the best of both worlds, and an adroit, nimble community or leadership is gonna be able to provide both uh, with patience and vision. We talk a lot about confidence and competence at one table. So what has to be present to create a Jewish experience? What has to be present to create a Shabbat dinner? It's gotta be on Friday. And we want you to elevate time and we want you to elevate space. And in Judaism, we do that by lighting candles, raising a glass of Kiddush wine, eating delicious food, and starting that nourishment by expressing gratitude to a power greater than ourselves for this food. Now, if you don't know how to do that, it's really tricky. So you got to have tradition in one hand and innovation in the other. You can't just run in and say, innovate, reboot, redo, renew, because as I like to say, if you don't got the boot, it's really hard to reboot. You need to have something to work from. You need to know where these things come from. And not only do you need to know, it's really cool where they come from. You so you should definitely know. So you have to create resources. Now, again, we focus on young adults, 20s and 30s, right? So our resources are designed to reach them. And we have ritual mixology workshops where we take a classic cocktail and remake it with a twist. And while we do that, we're learning about traditional ritual and how to remix it. Jack. <laughs> we also have our Shabbat dinner guide that's been accessed close to 7,000 times in the past year and a half. How do people find that? Nobody is going online. Our one table hosts are not going online, Googling, how do I say kiddish? They're finding it because someone posted it on social media. Uh, another host whose dinner they went to um, read one of our meditations or led a blessing that they found in the guide and they heard it at their dinner. They saw our Instagram takeover and they were completely inspired by the chef who baked the rainbow sprinkle challah. That's a thing. So social media is hugely important. It's how people are connecting. It's one of the ways people are connecting. And we want to leverage those things to help get the resources in people's hands, right? We want to get it into their hearts and their minds. I, I, I'll just make two points on this. The first is um, you, you can't uh, overstate the importance of social networks. And the basic idea is this. Um, what your friends do influences you. And what your friends of friends of friends do, the people you don't know influences you. And that's true in terms of your incidence of smoking and in terms of how you vote and how you spend money and whether you gain or lose weight and whether you feel depressed or excited or sad. Um, and that's been empirically studied. And, and there's a, an exciting value proposition over that, which is um, social networks elide the distinction between individual and group. People talk a lot about an individual and a group, the self and the community. A social network is neither. Um, it has a very different idea, which is that there is power in who your group of friends are. Um, that actually has theological consequences too. One of the more interesting takes on the early Hasidim um, is that it's not simply a replaying of Kabbalistic trends or pietism or an uproar against the Lithuanian establishment, but it's actually the value of dibuk chaverim, that people getting together in a social group, that fraternite has religious significance. And if you don't believe me, uh, try davening with your friends. It's a very different experience than being in a congregation. So there's an actual power in weight to social networks. It's not just a tactic. And the second thing I would say about DIY culture is that the price of admission is competence, in my book at least. And what I mean by that is I look at an example of, say, like Megillat Esther, where people created a holiday out of whole cloth with its own mitzvot and its own characteristics. And they did so in Persia, apparently, uh, in a story where the heroine seems to be an intermarried Jewess, and no one seems to raise an eyebrow about that. But the author of that text chose to write in Hebrew, not in Aramaic, like Ezra and Nehemiah, and not in Persian. So that person was, whoever that person or persons was, was fluent in Hebrew, and they clearly knew the whole Tanakh because they're quoting it left and right throughout the entire Megillah, and they're playing with it, and they're using intertextual allusions. So the person who creates a new holiday, a new theology, a new set of mitzvot is also a master of the tradition at hand. 
And for me, that's the DIY that, that really lights me up. I want to see people um, uh, accepting that level of competence and creativity uh, as just as at the same time. Right. I have many more questions, but I want to provide an opportunity for uh, members of our audience here and even members of the audience who are watching the streaming uh, to pose some questions. There will be a mic on the, well, to my left over here. Uh, if you're interested in posing a question, kindly come up uh, and pose the question and make clear to whom the question is addressed. We're going to take a series of questions and then we will respond to a group of them. And as you uh, ask your questions, we'd love to know who you are and where you're from. Thanks. Sure. I'm Daniel Olson. I live in Westchester County. Um, thank you to all four of the speakers tonight. This question is related to the previous conversation. Um, so as I understand it, being a woke person means paying attention to ways groups of marginalized people are oppressed by structural forces and then working to dismantle such forces suggesting deep care about some kinds of communal issues, though perhaps not Jewish parochial ones. And those very same people are deeply interested in curating their personal individualized selves. So how have or might Jewish professionals working in either established or new institutions allow for expression of both of these millennial characteristics? We're going to take more questions first, all right? Hi. Uh, I thought it was a powerful presentation. Thank you. Um, my question is Can how... Introduce yourself. Oh, uh, my name is Michael Rand. I live on the Upper West Side. I was a student here at one point while I was studying across the street. Um, and my question, which is somewhat related to the previous one, is how do institutions become entrepreneurial or become, do these things that you said? Because uh, my sense is it's hard for that to happen. So for example, here at JTS, and I'm not an insider here, just what I read in the press, um, there was a rabbi who uh, runs a lab shul who got smiche here, but, and then because of various issues sort of decided this was not his way of doing things and, and, you know, and has now gone his own way. And uh, there's the Hadar Institution, which I think at one point was considered part of, or something out of JTS or out of the conservative movement, and now, if I understand correctly, wants to be seen as separate from that. Um, and just in the Jewish Week this last week, there was an article about how uh, Jews are writing novel, um, comic novels, Haggadahs, comic novel Haggadahs. And uh, I know that JTS has a program in Judaism and the arts. So why aren't people like that connected to this place? And why isn't this a hub of activity by people like that? Or, or someone else who I met at Lamoud who created a comic on Pirkei Avot. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Please. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm Neil Blumoff's son. I live in Westchester, and I lived in Brooklyn for five years before that. Um, so it seems like whether it's in the synagogue or whether it's at a table in the home or wherever it is, the response that everyone has given focuses on ritual, focuses on experiential tactics in order to draw people back into the Jewish fold. And I think that that's certainly a big part of it. But something that seems to be a subtext of this that hasn't been addressed is, is the intellectual draw of Judaism. Um, I think that, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Wertheimer mentioned the New Atheism Movement, and uh, also uh, uh, Rabbi Smokler mentioned the, the feeling of lostness uh, and the existential uh, crises that people are going through, which, you know, is... It's a perennial issue, but it's something that you know people face more and more and more intensely with every generation. And uh, you know, since from the 50s and 60s onward, I, pe I think people from Judaism and Christianity and a lot of Western religions have either 
been drawn away from them or gravitated towards Eastern religions because the metaphysics was not related to them, because intellect was not dealt with. Real, real questions about God were not addressed. And you know, it's, it's fine to, you know, there, there are certainly many personality types which are drawn into Judaism through the experience, but there are many other people who, you know, don't get the answers they want from clergy don't get the, you know, the existential and philosophical answers they want from clergy, and they don't find it by themselves in the text. Uh, and so they're drawn elsewhere. They're drawn either into other ideologies, which may be more or less dangerous, or they're drawn into other faiths, which, you know, are, you know, do kind of advertise their metaphysics more on the surface. Um, so sure. my question in general is how, how does one, you know, combine this sort of fun approach to Judaism with real intellectual rigor? Uh, how can that be communicated in all the different settings that you've described? Okay. Anybody want to start? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I wanted to make two comments about the first question and the third one. Um, I'm not sure that there are answers to those kinds of profound questions, but there is serious intellectual work and rumination, and, and I don't think anything, you know, on a personal level that I'm presenting here, I, I take my intellectual life very seriously and ideas very seriously. But I'm not sure that the, the question that you're raising is is as is as sharp as it might be. I'm not sure that there are are um, answers or or to those existential concerns. But there are lived responses, and uh, that doesn't mean that one should sacrifice one's intellect on the altar of of uh, of experience. But um, nonetheless, there might be an expectation that's a bit too high for what one can actually provide in a religious life. I'm not sure we have answers as much as, as lived responses. And, and I just wanted to add one thing about the woke um, culture in question, which I thought was a, was a great question, but there's, there's an implicit moral aspiration in the sort of culture of wokeness, which is the idea that um, excluding someone is the highest form of cruelty and that cruelty is the worst thing that people can do. And I, I, I think there's some truth to that, but it's not the only virtue that guides a community. The idea of not wanting to exclude is, is a paramount virtue, but it must be seen as competing with other virtues that are within a community. And we've sort of gone off the deep end on that idea and thinking that what makes the community moral is its unwillingness to ever exclude, whereas that's one strand in the larger braid of what makes up the moral life of a community. Uh, I want to start with the second question. Oh, my friend, it is happening here. I went here, and this place helped shape me. And not only did it help shape me, but when I was a student here, I started a dance party Shabbat afternoon prayer situation called Ecstatic Mincha. And he came to it, and she's doing it here. And she did one here today in this room. Her. She's a student here. It is alive and well in the seminary. Maybe we're just not talking about it enough, and I need to write an op-ed. OK, Arnie, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and not only did I go here, but I learned by becoming a conservative rabbi that more so than some of the takeaway is that I really felt like they were there for me during the screw ups and the parts where I fell and the parts where I wasn't sure who I wanted to be as a leader or who I wanted to be as a rabbi or even if I wanted to identify as a conservative Jew and I could ask those questions here and that was okay and I am proud of that. It's happening here, Michael. You should come hang out at the seminary. I lived here for two years. Thanks. I, I would like to continue our conversation, Elijah, about that third one, which we've been talking about for many, many years. Uh, but I, I think that, that uh, much of this is about um, established, trusted, long-term relationships. And Dan, I was really struck just by you saying, would you rather daven with your friends or in a community minion in the synagogue? And the goal would be that those people become your friends with daily practice. And that's the, that's the challenge. And I think as people express themselves or offer themselves in their multiple identities, that that becomes part of the ethos of the congregation as well. And I think, too, that it doesn't, it, there's not a, just to speak about the third question for a second, there's no bifurcation between ritual as entertainment, let's say, or ritual as uh, inviting mechanism and intellectualism. I think that there's a fact that if you do intellectual pursuit well, it actually can be very entertaining. And I think that that's something that a lot of our colleagues uh, endlessly try to do and try to find the language. And I think pursuant to all three questions, you know, even if you're in a city like New York, 
Uh, I think it's, it's incumbent upon all of us who are doing this serious work to get to know our city, to get to know other folks within the Jewish community, of course, but also outside the Jewish community. Because I think that like-mindedness breeds this kind of enthusiasm that will, again, empower both a home, empower one's sense of identity, one sense of seriousness of purpose, and recognize, again, that it's not either or, it's both and, and it can happen with invested partners together. Oops, go ahead. Thank you. So thank you all very much. I'd like to invite uh, Chancellor Eisen to offer some concluding remarks. This was a very encouraging evening. I'm tempted to take a poll. Let's do it. How many people are leaving the room tonight more encouraged about the Jewish future than you were when you walked in? How many people are walking out less encouraged about the Jewish future than when you walked in? All right. So we did pretty well. We did pretty well. We have some work to do with you all, but we'll get to you afterwards. The thing is that to me, I, I'm going I'm to mention three things and then it's, it's, it's late. One is... Quality of leadership matters. This is our guiding axiom at JTS. And the three people here, plus Jack, who's been in the leadership business now, we've both been doing it for a generation or so. But w without flattering you, all, I'm not talking about you in flattery, but the privilege of being at JTS is you see that we are continuing to generate, not just at JTS, but all over the Jewish world, a lot of really bright and soulful individuals are going to the business of Jewish leadership trying to provide experiences of meaning and community to more and more Jews. This is the most encouraging thing I know about the Jewish future, which is the quality of the people devoting their lives to working on behalf of that future. That, that is the key to my own faith that this is going to happen. So the three people here tonight on this panel are three people among dozens and dozens of people working throughout the United States and Canada and beyond the United States and Canada to, to produce Jewish leadership. Secondly, I was, I was heartened by the emphasis in the panel tonight on the eternal verities. And I'm heartened, starting with Jack, by the refusal to somehow write off millennials as if millennials are going to have less soul than baby boomers and less heart than baby boomers and less mind than baby boomers, as if somehow these millennials are lesser and they're not going to see through the schlock that's thrown their way and the consumerism, but they're going to fall for superficiality and nonsense. I don't believe that for one minute. So I believe that the human soul is an eternal need of nourishment and that, as Dan put it so beautifully, the material is there. I don't know if we need to rely on Alec Baldwin to provide us for wisdom, but it was good. It drove the point home. It drove the point home. Not the man I normally associate with profundity, but okay. In this case, he got it right. The material is there. And when you look at the Torah, and you can go deeper and deeper into it, let me confess that when I was in my early 20s, I sometimes was afraid that I was going to outgrow the Torah. I really had this fear that somehow I was going to outgrow it, either emotionally or intellectually, and I was going to come to see it as immature or not worthy of my adulthood. And boy, was I surprised, and pleasantly so, to find out that no matter how far I went into life, the Torah was there ahead of me and beyond me and deeper than me and higher than me, and it's something profound to teach me. And that was, uh, that was really a lesson, and I think that, that our millennials and everyone else is learning that all over again. That's what gives me more hope than anything for the Jewish future. As Dan said, the material is there. And then finally, I'll refer to the dance and the nigun, the dance and the nigun of Jess and Neil, and say that, you know, they, they remind us, uh, I was just reading Michael Fishbane's wonderful book, Sacred Attunement, today I was teaching it this morning, and Fishbane uses the arts as an example of elements of life that are all around us that point us beyond ourselves to something larger, something beyond, something that, thank God, we can't capture in our formulas or our organizations or institutions. And that is what's going to be the future of Judaism because Judaism has had that for 3,000 years in abundance and always will. And that is an eternal need of the human being, the human spirit. We need dance. We need song. We need wisdom. And uh, I think we've just, to my mind, had a very inspiring example of why 
there's a lot of hope around for renewal and for change and for depth. And uh, I, I'm certainly one of those that's coming away um, encouraged again. Thank you all for being here.